Hello on One Plus One this week, soul searching in the Labour Party, why footballers misbehave and why the world ignored the genocide in Cambodia. I'm Jane Hutchin. Welcome to the program. The Labour Party has lost its beliefs, its conviction and its ability to persuade the electorate. That's according to Labour historian and a former minister in the New South Wales RAN government, Rodney Cavalier. He's just released a book called Power Crisis and he's given his first television interview to Steve Kinane. Rodney Cavalier, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you, Steve. In the introduction to your book, you're described as an active and despairing member of the Labor Party. Why the despair? Uh, I um, don't believe it's the party I joined 42 years ago. It's very hard to see what belief systems or values motivate the party at any level. If you don't believe, it's very hard to advocate. If you don't advocate, you can't persuade. Hence, we've become the prisoner of focus groups. We give back what the interpreters of focus groups say the punters want to hear. Is that just the Labor Party who does that? No, I think it's a, an endemic problem of uh, Western politics. It's a serious problem for democracy. When did the belief system of the ALP start to disintegrate? It's a good question, Steve. It's part of a, a, wide, a worldwide collapse of ideology. The end of communism, the collapse of the Soviet Union meant that a certain binding discipline on the left came to an end. The uh, end of any organisational relevance of the National Civic Council, a uh, uh, a minority uh, shock group of organised Catholics of a particular persuasion aimed to intending to defeat the Labor Party, th that came to an end at about the same time because they had no reason to oppose the Labor Party as such. Uh, and the desire to win at all costs, the pragmatism or more harshly opportunism, that a win was everything, a win regardless of whatever programs you might wish to bring about, uh, governments that governed according to opinion polls rather than to, according to programs. They're all part of the same brew and it's certainly not just a Labor Party problem. In your book you write about a political class taking over the Labor Party. Who is that political class and what have they done? The political class are people on salary and wages who work for trade unions, ALP head office, ministerial advisers, uh, MPs. They are a coherent class, uh, according to every Marxist definition, they're conscious of their own existence, work together to advance their own interests. And they are in control of the Labor Party, lock, stock and dividend stream. Is it such a bad thing to have that kind of background? I am suggesting a cooling off period so that no one can use being on a minister's staff or being a union official or being in the party office uh, to use that to get a pre-selection. That there has to be a period between that uh, employment and standing for pre-selection. I would suggest to be not less than five years. The party has no chance of reforming itself unless it breaks what has become a monopoly, and I mean a monopoly of winnable seats that go to the political class. So is the problem that the, it narrows the gene pool, that the, uh, the amount of people that Labor has to draw on in the community suddenly narrows? You've got a phenomenon, and it's now becoming true of the Liberal Party, of people going from school to university, being cased while there to join one or the other party, one of two factions inside the Labor Party, going from uh, university with or without a degree onto the staff of someone and working their way up. The gene pool is dramatically narrowed as a result of that and life's experiences, the normal uh, processes of living don't apply. As we get older, we become more conservative or we become less conservative. Certainly, we change. If you are employed, whereby the key point of your employment is rigid orthodoxy to the prevailing belief, that is, uh, the government's views on climate change are good today when it supports climate change and good tomorrow when it's abandoned climate change, then there is no prospect of intellectual growth. Well, you were, you're a member of the New South Wales Parliament between 1978 and 1988. When you joined that parliament, what were the backgrounds of the Labor members at that time? The, they were uh, remarkably diverse, remarkably diverse. Uh, it was, we had uh, blokes in the parliament who had uh, worked on the railways, uh, driven trucks, bricklayers like uh, Jack Ferguson, toolmakers like Pat Hills, a barrister like Neville Rand, a, a leading QC, uh, someone who'd been a school teacher like uh, Ken Booth. I could go through almost every occupation under the sun. Even Why does that make for a better government? I was even going to say an ABC uh, broadcaster like Bob Devis. Why does it make for a better government? Because you've got the whole range of life's experiences instead of the charnel house of gossip of what is involved in being a 
part of the political class. I wanted to move on to the issue of the unions. Within the Labor Party, uh, policy platforms are voted on at state and national conferences. And on the floor of conferences, 50% of the votes come from the trade union movement. Yet over 80% of the Australian workforce do not belong to unions. How does Labor allow unions to have such a huge influence when they're clearly not representative of the vast majority of workers? Well, they're not representative of the vast majority of workers. They're not representative of the even larger majority of the Australian electorate. 92% of Australian electors cannot belong to a trade union affiliated with the ALP. There's a, uh, a, an injustice within an injustice in as much as there is a large number of unions who are not affiliated with the ALP. They tend to be the growth unions in the public service and education. Uh, the proportion, you mentioned 50%, but I can remember when unions got out to 73%, were brought back to 60%, they're now 50%. Those numbers uh, constitute control. If it was 40% or 30%, they would still be in control of the party because they are, for all operative organisational purposes, a block vote. You've got to reduce that proportion to somewhere below 15, around about 10, 12, 8, something like that, in order for their hegemony to be broken. Will that change? Will that union block of 50% diminish? Uh, it might diminish on the margins, but not such as to forfeit control. Always remember Mao's dictum, no ruling class gives up its power without a struggle. What about the membership of the party? One estimate I saw was that the Labor Party uh, only represents, membership-wise, 0.27% of the population. Yeah, and that's, a, that, that's a, a devastating and all but an answerable riposte to what I've said. There has to be a dramatic regrowth of the branches. The branches have to be revitalised. You have to have members in the tens of thousands joining and rejoining. Some sort of amnesty to get people back. The disillusionment is not something new. It's, it's, it's a persistent thing because people of goodwill, people of intelligence work out. Unless they have ambition for a job or a seat in Parliament, there is no point in belonging. Now, there, is, there are exceptions to that, but they are a sliver, as so the numbers you've given. it's not just because meetings are boring? Meetings can be boring. But I assert that if a meeting is interesting and you've got an efficient secretary and you pass motions and you engage in a lot of correspondence and you push it up the line, what you run into is indifference, a brick wall, uh, tardy replies or non-replies. So the more idealistic, the more enthusiastic, the more committed, the more interesting a branch meeting is, the more total is the disillusionment at the end of it. So it's a sense of powerlessness within the membership that leads them to quit? It's a sense of powerlessness for a good reason. They are powerless. They are strangers in their own party. So given all your despair, why are you still a member of the party? It's a good question and um, I intend to remain for whatever I can do. But the fact that you're still a member and the fact that you still put out your newsletter after 15 years suggests to me that you still have a glimmer of hope. I have a glimmer of hope or I'm totally demented. <laughs> Which one do you think it is? Could be, oh, I should imagine huge amounts of both. Mark Latham, a couple of years ago, famously said to university students at the University of Melbourne, don't bother, don't bother joining, don't bother running for parliament. Are you that cynical no, about not. the political process? Absolutely not. I think that it's uh, imperative that people find out if I'm right or wrong and hopefully prove me dead wrong. Rodney Cavalier, thanks a lot for coming on One Plus One. Thank you, Steve. Australian author Catherine Fox writes crime fiction and, as a former doctor with an interest in forensic medicine, she's familiar with victims as well as the perpetrators. Her latest book, Death Mask, deals with football players and their behaviour off-field, a topic that emerged again in the aftermath of the AFL final. Catherine Fox, welcome to One Plus One. How did you come to include footballers in your latest book? It's actually been brewing for about 15 years, this story for me, because as a naive, young, you know, middle class, very insulated doctor, I went into general practice. And one of my first patients was just horrifying. It was a woman who had saved herself for a wedding night for religious reasons and had come back from a honeymoon with multiple sexually acquired infections, none of which her husband had. And my job in 15 minutes in general practice was to try and sort out how and why. And obviously the first assumption is that she's had multiple partners and hasn't let on. But to be honest, I believed her that she had not been with anyone else. And this poor woman was absolutely distraught. Her husband didn't seem to be as affected and he just didn't want to be there and wanted to get out. And anyway, after 
reading his body language and he certainly nothing was right there and eventually he admitted that he and his fr and his teammates in the fo local football team had drugged her and they'd all had intercourse that night because that was one of their team rituals they did everything as friends they had done since high school and he didn't see this is a horrific issue at all. They didn't think it, it was rape because he'd given consent on her behalf. That was the way he saw it. And the second issue for him was that it wasn't rape. Rape is something violent that happens in the street with a man in a balaclava. This was something she'd never remember, so she couldn't possibly be traumatised by. And part of my job was to also retrace the contacts because they're notifiable infections and you have to source the contacts and then find out who these other people were. And he was adamant that these men are, are family men. This had ruined them. And he still had no concept that what he'd done to this woman, the woman he supposedly loved, because his mateship meant more. This is one case that you came up against as a doctor. Yes. How do you know it's common practice as a ritual in football? Well, this, it surprised me that this was such a, um, a low grade, if you like, just local club. It wasn't associated with celebrity, big payouts, adulation from players, things that we normally have associated with um, footballers behaving badly. And so it seemed to me that this was this culture permeating. And then as I got interested in sexual assault medicine, I became aware that there are a lot more women who go to sexual assault centres and are examined, but they don't take that on to go to the police. And if 85% of women don't report rape, then we're looking at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the cases that actually do come to public light. Do you think Australia has a particularly bad reputation when it comes to how footballers behave off the field? Sadly, no. We're nowhere near as, um, we don't stand out as being more misogynist or more animalistic towards women. This is a universal problem. This is the scary thing that I discovered while researching Death Mask was that the UK soccer players, it's a ubiquitous problem. The NRL in the United States, ice hockey, uh, any of the contact sports, soccer's not theoretically a contact sport, but these are male dominated team sports. So who's responsible for allowing this to continue? I think there are lots and lots of reasons. One is, you know, even Stephen Fry the other night was talking about the public school boys in England and prison. And these are male dominated things. But these footballers are actually in their 30s and they're still in a male orientated. It's almost like an ongoing school where they're told what to do, they're timetabled, they're scheduled, they eat together, they play together. And it's almost as though they're still in this boys' school environment. But you have the leaders of the different codes absolutely speaking out against this kind of behaviour. Are they not doing their job properly? I think they're trying, but I think it's going to take generations.